right, welcome everyone. Uh, it is uh, my pleasure today to welcome Dr. Alexander Young for the CIC lecture today. So Alex is an MRC Skills Development Fellow in the Center of Neuroimaging Sciences at King's College London. Um, I have been following her work for some time now, so I'm really excited that she accepted to give a talk today. Uh, as a reminder for everyone, uh, please keep your microphones muted during the presentation. Uh, if you have any questions during the talk, you can raise your hand or write them in the chat, and I will find an opportune moment to interrupt Alex and ask the question. Uh, also, as well, uh, Alex agreed to hold a student, uh, student discussion at the end of the presentation, so anyone who's interested to stick around uh, for a chat, uh, then feel free to do so. And um, on that note, uh, the floor is yours. Great. Yeah, so thanks for inviting me. So uh, today I'm going to talk about the work we've been doing on characterizing uh, the progression and heterogeneity of neurodegenerative diseases using um, data-driven disease progression models. So I'm going to start off by talking about uh, what disease progression models are and how they work. And then I'm going to talk a bit about the sustain algorithm, which combines disease progression models with uh, clustering, enabling you to estimate subtypes as well as disease progression patterns. And then I'll talk about applications in a few different conditions. And uh, finally, I'll discuss how to apply these methods in your own research for anyone who's interested in doing so. Um, ah, great. So uh, neurodegenerative diseases tend to be long-term and complex. And this time, time scale can be as long as several decades with a very long pre-symptomatic phase. Um, so I'm going to use Alzheimer's disease as the main example in this first part of the talk, but uh, the same ideas apply to many different um, neurodegenerative diseases. So in this schematic of Alzheimer's disease, we can see that different biomarkers are dynamic at different disease stages. And uh, the typical form of Alzheimer's disease is thought to begin with um, amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles, which can be measured in the CSF or using uh, PET imaging. And this is then followed by um, less specific imaging changes, such as atrophy on structural MRI, and particularly in the hippocampus and the medial temporal lobe, and also by decline in cognition measured by cognitive tests. So it's likely that multiple biomarkers are needed to track the disease all the way from the beginning to the end, as each biomarker is most dynamic and so uh, more sensitive at a different disease stage. So in this data-driven model of dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease, we can see um, that the disease takes place over several decades uh, with a lot of biomarker changes happening before any symptoms occur. And also um, additional complexity can arise from heterogeneity in the spatial distribution of pathology, which then produces further heterogeneity in disease biomarkers. Um, so for example, in neuropathology, we see that uh, different stages of the diseases at are affected at different stages of the disease affect different brain regions. And neuropathology also shows that there are disease subtypes where different regions are affected in individuals who are at the same disease stage. So quantitative models of disease biomarkers can enable us to map out this type of complexity by looking at how different biomarkers change with disease stage. And we can then compare how these biomarker change biomarkers change with disease stage um, across different diseases or in uh, different disease subtypes. And these types of quantitative models can um, not only help us understand uh, disease heterogeneity, but they could also be used for um, diagnosis and prognosis or for stratification for uh, clinical trials or for treatment assignment. Um, and they can do this by allowing us to take new patient data and then to compare it with uh, different quantitative models and enable us to evaluate um, which disease or disease subtype an individual has and at what stage along the progression of that disease or disease subtype they are. So the problem is that constructing quantitative models of disease biomarkers in um, diseases such as neurodegenerative diseases where they take place over long timescales is incredibly difficult. So the standard statistical technique would be to use uh, regression to so plot um, biomarker values against disease stage for lots of individuals, and then you try to identify a trend in the data. The problem with doing this is that this requires an accurate measure of disease stage in order to place individuals along the um, time axis. So in dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease, we can do this quite well because um, we know that a child of a carrier has a 50% chance of inheriting the condition. Um, 
And so we can estimate the time of symptom onset based on the parent's age of onset and use that as a time axis. Um, but in more common sporadic neurodegenerative diseases, it's difficult to find anything to use as a time axis. So uh, one thing you might think of trying would be to use a measure of disease stage, but typically, typically you have uh, very few categories, so you might just have mild, moderate or severe disease. Um, you could try measuring one biomarker against another, for example, using a cognitive test score to stage individuals. Um, but it's likely that no single biomarker is dynamic for the whole disease, so you might miss a proportion of the disease. Um, another technique you could try would be to follow individuals all the way from the start of the disease to the end. Um, but this would take uh, decades and it would be difficult to collect a large enough sample or to identify um, who to follow, um, particularly in the pre-symptomatic stages. So uh, data-driven disease progression modeling is a type of unsupervised or sometimes semi-supervised learning, which aims to reconstruct disease progression patterns directly from a data set um, without requiring a predefined uh, time axis. So this provides us with a fine-grained picture of disease progression, as well as a data-driven staging system that can be used to assign uh, patients to disease stages. Uh, and to do this, uh, disease progression models tend to assume that all individuals follow a single disease progression pattern, uh, meaning that they can model heterogeneity in disease stage, but not in disease subtypes. So um, somewhat counterintuitively, you can actually use um, disease progression models to reconstruct progression patterns from purely cross-sectional data without having any longitudinal follow-up. And this is done by making two uh, basic assumptions. So the first is that each biomarker is monotonic. So this means that the biomarker measures of the pathology can only increase as the disease progresses. And the second is that all of the individuals follow a single disease progression pattern. Uh, so to give an intuitive example of how this works, um, imagine that we collect the cross-sectional data set that I'm showing on the left uh, from individuals at different unknown stages of the same disease. And what we can see when we look at this data set is that we have some individuals in which only the temporal lobe is affected. So we could infer that this hypothetical disease starts in the temporal lobe. Uh, we also have some individuals in which the temporal and parietal lobes are affected. Uh, so we can infer that the parietal lobe is affected after the temporal lobe. And then finally, we have uh, some individuals in which the temporal, parietal and frontal lobes are affected. Um, so we can infer that the frontal lobe is affected after the temporal and parietal lobes. Um, so the disease progression model I'm going to focus on that can um, perform this type of analysis is um, the earliest model that was developed in our group, which is the event-based model. So the event-based model um, formulates this idea of estimating progression from cross-sectional data uh, mathematically um, by describing uh, progression as a probabilistic uh, Bayesian disease progression modeling model. Uh, so the event-based model um, describes progression as a series of events where each event corresponds to a new biomarker becoming abnormal. And this gives you a data-driven time axis where each stage in the event-based model corresponds to a new biomarker becoming abnormal. So for example, if you have a disease that progresses from region A to region B to region C, then we'd have uh, stage one where uh, biomarker A becomes abnormal. Um, stage two would be biomarker B becomes abnormal. So patients at this stage would have biomarkers A and B being abnormal. And then uh, stage three would be biomarker C becoming abnormal. So patients at this stage would have uh, all three biomarkers being abnormal. So what the event-based model does is to describe the probability of observing a particular data set given a particular order in which biomarkers become abnormal. So for example, in this case of uh, three regions or three biomarkers, we could use this model to evaluate the likelihood of all of the possible um, progression sequences in a given data set. Um, so for three biomarkers, we'd only have six different possible sequences. Uh, the probability that each region or biomarker has become abnormal is then determined using uh, mixture modeling, which um, is used to inform the probability of each uh, possible progression pattern for a data set.
So the typical way of performing the mixture modeling in the event-based model is to use a Gaussian uh, mixture model. Um, and this is good for anything that has a kind of Gaussian distribution. Um, but there are a lot of examples where we have non-Gaussian data. So for example, uh, cognitive tasks with floor and ceiling effects. Um, so we also now have a version where you can use uh, kernel density mixture modeling instead, which is, um, it basically enables you to fit a mixture of two non-parametric distributions to your data. Um, so the distributions don't have any predefined uh, shapes, so they're more flexible for working with different types of data. So because the event-based model is uh, Bayesian in its formulation, it also naturally deals with uncertainty. Um, so this means that rather than just estimating the most probable disease progression pattern in your data set, uh, you can also estimate the probability of each possible prog progression pattern. So um, for three biomarkers, this would be simple as you could go through and evaluate the probability of each of the six possible sequences. Um, for larger number of biomarkers, um, it won't be possible to evaluate all of the combinations. Um, so to do that, we, we use um, MCMC sampling, which allows us to estimate this type of uh, uncertainty. Uh, so the event-based model is one of the uh, earliest disease progression models. And so it's quite simplistic in terms of the progression patterns you can learn. Um, so it can only learn a set of transitions of biomarkers from a normal to an abnormal level. So uh, more recently, we've developed a number of more uh, fine-grained extensions to the event-based model that allow you to model uh, more complex progression patterns. So the first one I wanted to mention is the uh, piecewise linear uh, Z-score model. Um, and this basically replaces the normal abnormal events with Z-score events. So this allows you to model um, the severity level of each uh, biomarker. And then in the piecewise linear uh, model, the, um, each stage corresponds to a new biomarker reaching a new Z-score relative to a control population. So you have a um, number of biomarkers by number of Z-scores um, stages. Uh, so the, the model is then able to determine the order in which the biomarkers reach different Z-scores. Um, and this is based on the assumption that the errors are Gaussian. And so it's best assumed, uh, it's best suited to imaging data or other types of continuous um, variables. The second uh, extension that we've developed is the scored events model. Um, this is designed for scored ordinal data, such as uh, visual ratings from imaging or um, ratings from neuropathology or cognitive tests where you have a kind of graded scores where there's only a few categories rather than a kind of continuous cognitive test score. Um, so this model um, allows you to model the severity level of each biomarker as well, um, but uh, it assumes instantaneous transitions from one score to another because in, in an ordinal data set, you don't have uh, in-between scores. Um, one of the nice things about this type of model is that it's very flexible in terms of the types of probability distribution you can use. So you can use it to model non-Gaussian data. You can basically use any probability distribution that you, that you like. Um, you just provide it with um, the probabilities as input. Uh, so the event-based model and its variants have been used across a range of different applications uh, to a variety of neurodegenerative diseases. So, um, a lot of the applications have been in Alzheimer's disease where the event-based model has been used to characterize um, disease progression patterns and predict disease outcomes in both um, sporadic and dominantly inherited forms of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and it's been used on uh, imaging data as well as biomarker data and cognitive data. Uh, it's, it, the event-based model has also been used in posterior cortical atrophy, where it's been used to look at both uh, imaging data and um, cognitive test scores um, and how they evolve with disease progression. With disease progression. Uh, it's also been used in Huntington's disease, where it's been used to look at the progression of regional atrophy. And then in multiple sclerosis, the event-based model has been used to uh, look at the progression of grey matter atrophy and its association with disability. And finally, in uh, sporadic 
quite well, Jakob disease, uh, it's been used to look at um, the progression of abnormality based on visual ratings from MRI. Um, so this isn't an exhaustive list of applications, but hopefully it gives you an idea of the kind of types of applications that it's been used for and the range of different types of data it can be used with. So, so far I've talked about um, disease progression modeling, which deals with uh, heterogeneity that arises from individuals at different disease stages. Uh, so to do this, I said that most disease progression models assume that there's a single common pattern um, of disease progression that is the same across individuals. Um, so this works really well for identifying um, general trends in our data set, but um, what about disease subtype heterogeneity, which we know is there? So we know that from um, neuropathological studies that there is heterogeneity in the spatial distribution of pathology across uh, individuals at a similar disease stage. And we know that this then goes on to produce uh, distinct patterns of atrophy on MRI. So one possibility is that this heterogeneity arises just at a single point um, in the disease where we've um, observed people. Um, but what seems more likely is that um, each of the disease subtypes might also have its own uh, distinct disease progression pattern. And so we might see um, subtypes that are uh, different at different disease stages. Uh, so how could we learn about this subtype heterogeneity? So um, the most commonly uh, used technique to look at subtype heterogeneity is clustering. And this enables you to group together individuals that have similar biomarker or imaging profiles. And clustering works really well if you want to look at subtypes at a single common disease stage. So for example, if you have data that comes from um, the same stage of two subtypes A and B, where uh, one has predominantly frontal lobe atrophy and the other has predominantly temporal lobe atrophy, then it's likely that clustering would be able to group individuals into each of these two subtypes. So you'd have individuals with frontal atrophy being grouped together and individuals with temporal lobe atrophy being grouped together. Um, but problems start to show up if you have data that comes from a range of underlying disease stages because um, clustering starts to struggle because it's simply identifying subgroups rather than disentangling uh, disease subtypes from disease stages. So here, for example, if you try to cluster this type of data where you've got a mixture of subtypes and stages, you might get um, some individuals uh, clusters that cover a mixture of stages. You might get um, some that cover a mixture of subtypes. And it's possible that some clusters might even be a mixture of subtypes and stages. So uh, ideally, what we'd like to do instead is to directly recover um, the subtypes and the stages from our data. So subtypes and, subtype and stage inference, or uh, SUSTAIN, is an unsupervised learning algorithm that we've developed, which combines uh, clustering with disease progression modeling, which enables you to estimate both um, disease subtypes and disease stages simultaneously. So um, SUSTAIN enables you to input a set of heterogeneous uh, patient snapshots from a population. So this can be all cross-sectional uh, baseline measurements. And then it groups together these individuals into subtypes that have distinct progression patterns. And you can then use these reconstructed uh, subtype progression patterns to subtype and stage new patients by uh, matching individuals to the subtype and stage that best describes their measurements. Uh, and this can be done probabilistically. So you can find the probability that an individual has a particular subtype or stage combination. So if we uh, quickly revisit our previous example to build up an intuition of how this could be possible from cross-sectional data. So now um, instead we'll consider a cross-sectional data set where individuals have both different um, disease stages and these come from several different disease subtypes. So this time the only assumption that we'll make is that the disease uh, progression is monotonic. So each biomarker or region can only get worse with disease progression. So again, if we go through this example, we see that there are some individuals with just temporal lobe atrophy. So we can infer that there's a disease subtype A that starts in the um, temporal lobe. But in this data set, we also have individuals with just frontal lobe atrophy, but they don't have any temporal lobe atrophy. Um, so these individuals don't match with subtype A um, because they don't have any temporal lobe atrophy. 
So we can use these individuals that have uh, frontal lobe atrophy but not temporal lobe atrophy to infer that there's a second subtype B that starts in the frontal lobe. Um, and then likewise, we have individuals with uh, temporoparietal atrophy and we can infer that they would be likely to be a later stage of subtype A because they have uh, temporal lobe atrophy but not frontal lobe atrophy. And similarly, um, individuals with a frontal, frontal and parietal lobe atrophy would be likely to be a later stage of subtype B because they have frontal lobe atrophy but not temporal lobe atrophy. And then finally, um, individuals that have frontal, temporal and parietal lobe atrophy could be a later stage of either um, subtype. Um, so we've been able to infer from that data set that there were uh, two disease subtypes with different disease progression patterns. But um, of course, if we were to do this by hand, this process would get uh, really complex and we'd have to deal with added uh, problems such as uh, measurement noise in our real data set. So what Sustain does is to formulate this idea into a probabilistic unsupervised uh, machine learning algorithm. So this allows us to work with uh, much larger numbers of subtypes and biomarkers. Um, and the key thing about this is that it means we can uncover uh, much more complex patterns that are more difficult for humans to identify. So um, Sustain enables us to estimate the optimal subtype progression patterns and also the number of subtypes that best describe our uh, data set. Uh, it also characterizes the uncertainty in the progression patterns, as well as the uncertainty in the subtypes and the stages of individuals. Um, and to do this, I've, as I've mentioned, the sustain algorithm uses um, two different ideas and combinations. So the first is disease progression modeling, which is used to estimate the uh, progression pattern within a subtype. And this progression could be described using any of the disease progression models that I've described earlier um, and which one you would want to use would depend on the type of uh, data that you were working with. Um, and Sustain then uses clustering to group together individuals with common progression patterns. Um, so the Sustain algorithm basically alternates between um, assigning individuals to clusters and estimating the progression pattern for individuals within that cluster um, until the optimal cluster assignments and uh, the optimal progression patterns are found. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a range of different applications of sustain in different conditions. Um, the first condition I'm going to talk about is genetic frontotemporal dementia. So um, genetic frontotemporal dementia was the first uh, condition that we applied sustain to because there are different genetic groups that have relatively distinct uh, atrophy patterns. So this basically provides us with um, a way that we can test the ability of sustain to recover disease subtypes. So the experiment that we did was to analyze um, all of the different genetic groups together and then to test whether um, the subtypes identified by sustain would correspond to the different um, genetic groups um, without sustain knowing the genetic group labels. So to do this, we use the GEMFI dataset, which collects data from uh, carriers of mutations in three genes. Um, so we had 172 carriers of um, progranulin um, MAPT or C9 or 72 mutations. And we use this input to sustain um, regional volumes and a measure of uh, asymmetry. And we then measured um, atrophy in each region as a Z score relative to a control population, um, which consisted of individuals that didn't carry the genetic mutation. Um, and in this particular study, we modeled disease progression using um, a piecewise linear Z-score model um, because that's the most appropriate one for um, MRI data, which is continuous. Um, so what we found was that Sustain identified um, four different groups, which are shown in the four rows of this um, diagram with the stages of each progression pattern going from uh, left to right. And this color scheme shows um, mild atrophy in red, moderate atrophy in pink, and then severe atrophy in blue. And what we found was that despite the algorithm not being given any information about the genetic group, 
we found that these four subtypes showed strong alignment with the genetic groups. So um, we had uh, one group that had um, progranulin mutations, we had another subtype that had um, MAPT mutations, and the final two um, subtypes had uh, expansions in the C9 off 72 gene. So um, basically we were able to demonstrate not only that sustain could recover the genetic groups, also we were able to identify um, heterogeneity for individuals with um, C9 or 72 expansions. Uh, so we also tested whether the sustained subtypes would be useful to discriminate the genetic groups. And we found that the um, sustained subtypes could discriminate the genetic groups with a balanced accuracy of 86%. And we then uh, compared this to using clustering by itself without accounting for disease progression. Um, and we found that the balanced accuracy was only 69%. What you can see in the diagram is that the problem is that it conflates the um, stage severity with the subtype. So you have um, a severe frontal subtype, a severe temporal subtype, but then you also have this mild frontal temporal subtype, which um, could be an early stage of uh, either. Um, so what this demonstrated was that there can be a clear benefit to modeling the temporal progression as well as the subtypes. Uh, so since this study, the number of uh, participants in the GEMPI study doubled. So we've been uh, looking at more subtle types of heterogeneity um, using this larger number of uh, subtypes, uh, subjects. So um, one of the particular things we're interested in looking at is whether there was heterogeneity in individuals that have um, MAPT mutations, because uh, it's previously been shown that there are um, slightly different spatial atrophy patterns um, which are associated with uh, particular MAPT mutations. Um, so in this follow-up uh, study, we used data from 82 carriers of MAPT mutations, and we measured um, regional volumes in a much uh, wider range of regions. And this allowed us to gain uh, added sensitivity to more subtle differences in atrophy pattern um, that we might expect in these um, different mutations. Um, again, we measured the volumes as Z-scores relative to a control population of um, 300 non-carriers. Um, and we were also careful to avoid unblinding of the genetic status by only including mutations where there were both carriers and non-carriers with that particular mutation. Um, so we found that Sustain identified two distinct regression patterns amongst MAPT mutation carriers. So um, again, the color scale here goes from red to magenta to blue. So what we see is that the first subtype has a more typical atrophy pattern for MAPT mutation carriers with atrophy predominantly in the temporal lobe and the hippocampus at early sustained stages. Whereas um, the second subtype has a more uh, atypical pattern with more widespread atrophy uh, and in particular uh, it has earlier uh, frontal lobe atrophy in addition to um, temporal lobe atrophy. So we were then able to link the um, typical and the atypical atrophy pattern to particular mutations. Um, so in particular, we found that the um, typical uh, temporal subtype was strongly associated with IVS 10 plus 16 and R406W mutations, where we had a one-to-one -one mapping between the IVS 10 plus 16 and R406W mutations and the temporal uh, subtype. And yeah, we also saw that the um, atypical frontotemporal subtype was strongly linked to the P301 L mutation with 90% um, of individuals with P301 L mutations being assigned to the frontotemporal subtype. Uh, so next we looked at the cognitive profiles of each of the subtypes and we found that each subtype was uh, associated with a distinct cognitive profile. So um, we found that the typical subtype performed worse on memory tests um, and the atypical frontotemporal subtype performed worse on uh, tests of attention and visuospatial skills. Um, we then looked at validating the subtypes and stages longitudinally. Um, so here, what we would expect is that the subtypes should remain constant because they should correspond to the different genetic mutations. Um, and so 
they should re represent different biological processes, more or less. Um, but we'd expect that uh, individuals would progress in disease stage or sustained stage as the disease worsens. So um, we divided people into either uh, one of the two subtypes, or we classified some people into a normal appearing group if they had no appreciable atrophy. And we found that uh, 91 of the 92 visits were longitudinally consistent, um, meaning that the subtype either remained the same at follow-up or an individual progressed from uh, normal appearing to a subtype. Uh, and we can see in the table that no one um, moved between um, subtypes, which is good. Um, we had three individuals that progressed from normal appearing to the temporal subtype, um, and one individual that regressed from the frontotemporal subtype to normal appearing. Um, when we looked further into the individual that regressed, we actually found that they had a low confidence in their subtype assignment at baseline, um, with them only having a slightly higher probability of belonging to the frontotemporal subtype than being a uh, normal appearing. So uh, next I'm going to talk about the work we've been doing in Alzheimer's disease. So um, in this first study, we looked at heterogeneity in atrophy patterns using data from ADNI. Um, and we looked at two data sets. We looked at um, data collected from 3T MRI scans and 1.5T MRI scans, which, made as, um, which we used as a largely independent validation set. So there are only 59 individuals that are included in both data sets. Um, so to look at um, Alzheimer's disease prog progression and subtypes, we uh, we used um, we we used as input to sustain a regional free surfer volumes, um, which we then measured as Z scores relative to a control population. Um, and our control population here was amyloid negative, cognitively normal um, participants, uh, as measured on CSF. And what we found was that Sustain identified three distinct Alzheimer's disease progression patterns. Um, so a typical pattern, a cortical pattern, and a subcortical pattern. Um, so this is broadly in agreement with the heterogeneity observed in post-mortem studies, but we were able to characterize the full temporal progression of the subtypes, um, and in particular the early stages, um, which is um, useful for subtyping and staging individuals um, in vivo. So uh, we also tested whether the sustained subtypes and stages had utility for predicting future patient outcomes. So to do this, we uh, subtyped and staged individuals who had mild cognitive impairment at baseline using um, sustain on their MRI data. And we then looked at follow-up data to see whether their sustained subtype and stage assignment at baseline could be used to predict their risk of conversion to Alzheimer's disease. Um, and what we found was that both uh, subtype and stage at baseline altered the risk of conversion at follow-up. Um, and so here we can see a graph of what that looks like for each of subtype and stage. And we can see that um, both of them have different curves depending on whether you have a different subtype or a different stage. So this demonstrates that um, sustain provides added utility for um, patient stratification and for predicting um, outcomes. So another really interesting application of sustain in Alzheimer's disease is this study that came out recently, um, which was led by Jake Vogel, where um, we looked at spatiotemporal patterns of uh, tau deposition using tau PET. So uh, the really nice thing here is um, first that it's such a large study across multiple cohorts and traces, but also that it looks at tau PET, which is a more direct measure of the regional distribution of um, neurofibrillary tangles, um, as opposed to uh, volume loss, which could be caused by a number of pathologies. Um, so Jake looked at data from 1,667 individuals um, and identified four different tau PET subtypes, um, which he then replicated using a separate sample with a different uh, tracer. Um, and what he found was that there were two dominant subtypes, a limbic subtype and a posterior subtype, um, which each accounted for around 30% of the data. And he also found two uh, smaller but still quite significant subtypes, um, which was a medial temporal lobe sparing subtype, 
and a lateral temporal lobe subtype, which each accounted for around 20% um, of the data. Uh, so interestingly, these subtypes were actually quite common across the population. Um, he then looked at the clinical phenotypes of each subtype and found that the four subtypes were associated with different clinical phenotypes. So um, the limbic predominant subtype tended to have uh, more APOE4 alleles and worse performance on memory tests, whereas the medial temporal lobe sparing subtype tended to be uh, younger with fewer APOE4 alleles and um, worse executive function. And then the lateral temporal subtype tended to have worse performance on uh, tests of um, language and global cognition. Um, he also found that the subtype showed good uh, longitudinal stability. Um, so the subtype and stage assignments um, at baseline um, matched very well with the subtype and stage assignments at follow-up um, with most individuals remaining with the same subtype um, and progressing in stage. Um, yeah, so this is a study that was done by Damiano Archetti in um, Alberto Rodolfi's group in uh, Brescia. Um, and this looked at transferring sustained subtypes um, in Alzheimer's disease across different um, cohorts. So Damiano identified three subtypes that were based on regional atrophy patterns um, and showed that these subtypes were um, stable between baseline and follow-up in both the training and the test set. Um, and also that um, sustained stage was correlated with um, decline in MMSC score in both the training and the test set. And then he was also able to demonstrate that um, sustained subtype and stage based on MRI in combination when, when combined with MMSC and CSF A beta 142 um, were able to, to predict conversion from mild cognitive impairment to dementia. Um, and the final Alzheimer's disease application of sustain I wanted to mention was this study by um, Cassie uh, Pfeiffer and Joe Barnes, which looked at how um, white matter hyperintensities from MRI affect Alzheimer's disease progression markers. Um, and they were able to identify four groups, um, two of which had early changes in uh, white matter hyperintensities and two that had later changes in white matter hyperintensities. Um, so this suggests that uh, vascular dysfunction might be an early event in a subgroup of individuals with Alzheimer's disease. Um, uh, so there's also been uh, some interesting applications in multiple sclerosis. Um, so um, this is work that was performed by Arben Ishagi in MS that pulls together a huge data set from multiple clinical trials. Um, so Arben looked at um, nearly 9,000 subjects from uh, 15 clinical trials and three observational studies. And um, across the studies, um, Sustain identified uh, three different subtypes of multiple sclerosis, uh, which he was then able to validate externally. Uh, so the first was a cortex-led subtype. Um, the second was a normal appearing white matter-led subtype. And the final one was a lesion-led subtype. And these subtypes showed um, distinct disability progression patterns with the lesion-led subtype having the highest risk of disability progression. Um, and interestingly, the subtypes also showed that there were differences in treatment response that couldn't be identified when you looked at the standard clinical um, groups for MS. Um, and again, the lesion-led subtype showed the most uh, positive treatment response in clinical trials. Uh, so the last bit of work I wanted to mention is this joint work with um, Felix Bragman, where we applied sustain to CT images in lung disease. Um, so the nice thing here is that it demonstrates that sustain uh, is generalized enough that it can work in other conditions than neurodegenerative diseases. So um, in COPD, we were able to identify two subtypes that mirrored classical clinical phenotypes, and we uh, learned these in one data set and then validated them externally in a completely separate data set. Um, and one of the interesting outcomes of this study was that we were able to identify a group of at-risk smokers that were actually two and a half times more likely to progress to COPD at follow-up. So this demonstrates that sustain might be useful for early stratification of lung disease. 
Um, yeah, so finally, I thought I'd just try and give a bit of a practical overview on how to um, prepare data sustain in case anyone's interested in using it, just to give you a bit of insight into what the process is. Um, so I'd say that there are three main things that you have to think about. Um, so um, the first I've mentioned is that sustain can be used in combination with a number of different disease progression models. So you need to think about which disease progression model is best suited for the type of data that you're working with. Um, so we have three different options available at the moment, which I've mentioned. So the event-based model is um, normal to abnormal transitions. Um, it's appropriate for all types of data and is very flexible, but it can't model different severity levels of um, biomarkers. Um, the second option is the Z-score model, um, which is probably the one that you would use in most situations. So this describes biomarkers that progress along a piecewise linear trajectory from one Z-score to another. Um, and it's good for continuous data in general, so um, in particular MRI data or um, CSF. Um, the third is the scored events model, um, which is best for ordinal data. Um, so for example, clinical scores with particular categories, um, neuropathological ratings or visual ratings. Uh, so the second thing you need to think about before using sustain is how to choose your control population. Um, so this could be done manually using a study criteria or based on your own criteria. Or in some cases, you might have um, data sets in which you think there are a proportion of pre-symptomatic individuals within your control population. In which case, I would suggest that you might want to use uh, mixture modeling to identify a control population. Um, and this can be done in two ways, depending on whether you're looking at um, Gaussian data, or you can use the non-parametric version for, um, for example, with cognitive tests with floor and ceiling effects. Um, the last thing you need to do is to prepare your data and choose the settings for the algorithm. <coughs> and this uh, format will depend on the disease regression model that you're using. Um, <coughs> so uh, for the Z-score model, the data needs to be Z-scored relative to a control population. Um, whereas for the event-based model or the scored events model, you just input a probability that a biomarker is uh, normal or abnormal or that it has a particular score. Um, so that's uh, the event-based model and the scored events model are very flexible in that way because you can use any type of probability distribution. You just input the probabilities rather than um, data. Um, so the sustain algorithm can be run using the PySustain package that we've developed, which is available on GitHub, and I put the link below. Um, this is a really nice uh, object-oriented package, which um, Leon Axman and Peter Widgerantney have spent a lot of time um, developing. Um, and it, the great thing about it is that it enables you to plug in different disease progression models to use with sustain. Um, and it also provides the potential to add uh, new disease progression models if you're interested in using a custom disease progression model. Um, on the GitHub, there's also some older um, MATLAB code, which was written by me. Um, so if you prefer MATLAB, you could have a look at that. Um, but I definitely would recommend using this newer Python version because uh, that's the version that we're maintaining and we've been updating it with uh, new features as we go. Um, yeah, so if you if you are interested in using it, there's also tutorials um, that are available on the GitHub page. Um, you can find those under the tutorials section. Um, we have a set of uh, YouTube videos that go through the theory and the practical aspects of running Sustain. And we also have a Jupyter notebook, which contains example code to help you with getting started with running um, Sustain. Uh, so to conclude, um, disease progression modeling infers uh, fine-grained disease progression patterns from cross-sectional data. And uh, the sustain algorithm enables you to combine uh, disease progression modeling with clustering to identify um, disease subtypes and their progression patterns. Uh, I've shown a range of results that demonstrate the utility of sustain to characterize um, heterogeneity across a variety of conditions. And um, in particular, I've shown that heterogeneity can be linked to 
distinct clinical outcomes um, or genetic variation, um, as well as that sustain could potentially have utility for um, clinical trials or early stratification of individuals. Um, yeah, so thanks for listening. Um, the link for the GitHub is there as well. And I'm very happy to take any questions that anyone might have. Thank you so much for your presentation. I mean, um, it's it's just so fascinating to see uh, like this separation of the stages and the subtypes. And that's really something that wasn't really done before. Um, so for me, that's something that um, is always striking. Um, so it, yeah, like we, we can open the floor to questions. Um, so if anyone has any question, feel free to raise your hand or um, put your question in the chat. Um, so I think first up we have uh, Gabriel who has a question. Hi, a fantastic Hello. presentation and very cool piece of software and technique. I was wondering about what ha what we might be able to do if we have longitudinal data. Would you be able to apply a constraint within Sustain to extract out progression models, given the fact you'd actually know how various subjects progressed? Yeah, that's a really great question. So. Um... That's something that we're working on. Um, Peter Wajaratni in particular has done a temporal version of the event-based model, which can allow um, for multiple time points. And then it allows you to look at um, the time between different um, stages, basically. Um, so that hopefully it will be available to use with Sustain at some point. Um, <coughs> Currently, what I'd suggest doing is just using the longitudinal data for validation, um, but hopefully we'll have the facility to use it in a more advanced way in, in the kind of near future. Thanks. All right, and next up, we have a question kind of related to that as well. So from Rehan, um, he's asking, is there any particular type of error that's sustained with cross-sectional data may be susceptible to as opposed to using longitudinal data? Um, interesting, um, as opposed to longitudinal data, um, that's not something that I've thought about that much before. Um, do you have an example type of thing that you're thinking about? Hi, uh, no, it's not, that I think that there is some type of error. I was just wondering if there's like, oh, maybe this particular type of trajectory could be missed. Uh, yeah, I mean, what I would say is that I think for things like imaging markers, where you have a lot of um, variability across the general population, um, I think that adding longitudinal data should really increase your sensitivity to progression in a particular region. Um, so I think it might miss things. Um, I'm less sure about whether uh, examples of things where it might go wrong for cross-sectionally. Um, Okay, thank you. Uh, next up, we have a question for from Malar. Uh, thanks, Fred. Uh, and Alexander, lovely talk. I mean, really interesting methodology. I, I really enjoyed that. Um, the, the question I have is, most of the application data sets you showed are more neurodegenerative, uh, if I'm mm -hmm. not mistaken. And what would you do, what would happen if you went to the other side of the coin and you tried this on a neurodevelopmental data set? Where, you know, for example, if you had a high risk cohort for psychosis where you're expecting conversion rates to be somewhere between eight and 25%, and, you know, the variability that you, you observe is somewhat commingled with neurodevelopmental variability as well. Um, how do you, has, have there been applications to sustain on that in that direction? And what yeah, are your thoughts? Yeah, so um, in theory, it should work well for modeling development as well as um, disease because you just kind of looking at things um, growing rather than shrinking. Um, for something like psychosis, it would be a bit more complex because I think the changes are really subtle. Um, and so I think that's where a longitudinal version would particularly come in, in handy because um, you'd be able to look at much more subtle changes if you have multiple time points and you can kind of um, 
uh, disentangle the general heterogeneity and the size of a region across the population. Um, but yeah, uh, it hasn't hasn't been looked at yet. Thank you. All right. Um, I don't see any other questions for now, so I'll just jump in and ask my own. Uh, so I was just wondering, um, is the sustained uh, algorithm vulnerable to any, uh, let's say, multi-site effect? Because let's say that you're pulling data from a lot of different sites. There are some um, site-specific variables. So I'm just wondering if um, how um, sustained deals with that. Yeah, so that would be this. I kind of see it as the same as for any modeling. Basically, sustain won't deal with that directly. So it's all about correcting your data and making sure that your data represents similar things for each individual. So correcting the site effects. Um, and if you do that well, then it will work well. If you don't do that well, then it, it's going to be as vulnerable as anything else to that type of effect, definitely. That makes sense. That, uh, sorry, that makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> we have another question from Malar. Thanks. Just just to follow up there, would you imagine that something like combat would be a, a excellent pairing, you know, uh, with with your methodology as well, so that you can deal with those type of side effects? Yeah, definitely. If you could perform a pre-correction using that and then put the data in, it should work a lot better. Um, yeah. All right. Um, I have maybe another one uh, for you. So you mentioned one of the assumptions um, for, for the, the different disease progression model is that uh, we're assuming that it's always growing, right? Mm. Uh, but um, uh, how, um, how does the algorithm deal when, uh, let's say, for some participant, um, either for methodological reason, for instance, there's a the second visit or uh, there's less tau uh, than expected, uh, either because of methodologies or um, other biological processes. So I, I'm just wondering how would we deal uh, with something like that? Yeah, so at the moment, um, the implementations that we have are purely cross-sectional. So I guess the assumption is at the population level that amongst the population, you should generally see that a biomarker kind of worsens with disease progression. When you then went on to subtype and stage individuals, um, there's no kind of specific assumption that they have to go forwards in the disease. So I guess if, if it was just one specific marker that decreased, they probably would move backwards in stage and you'd see that in that sense. Um, yeah, in terms of thinking about um, whether or not you could have um, some kind of biomarkers that uh, got better and then got worse with, say, a treatment or in a different disease where that was the case. Um, you, there is potential to have that kind of um, have the assumption of monotonic progression relaxed a bit, um, but you would need, I think, some markers to be to be monotonic um, just to infer the kind of time or otherwise time could go forwards or backwards, and you don't really know the difference between the two. Um, yeah, so that that's an interesting thing to look at in uh, in future model developments as well. Well, thank you. Um, next up, we have another question from Gabriel. Thanks. Uh, related to what uh, Frederick just asked, um, what about data where you may have some measurements where there is, in theory, no difference? and then say an intervention, a drug intervention, a diet intervention, something like that? Um, measurements where there is no difference. I mean, so you're saying that the drug intervention has no difference or you? So let's say you have a cross. So I'm thinking mostly in longitudinal space because that's what we're typically doing, but you could conceptualize this as cross-sectional as well, where you have a set of uh, measurements objects where in theory, the subjects are not in, in any way different, at mm -hmm. least to start baseline kind of measures. And yeah. then later on in the, the data, you have 
subjects that have had an intervention. And I'm wondering how the modeling might handle something like that, given that it doesn't have a longitudinal uh, constraint yet. Yeah. So at the moment, I guess the individuals that um, did have a response to treatment probably would progress less in disease stage when you looked at them longitudinally than the individuals that didn't respond to treatment and you'd pick it up in that way. But um, yeah, of course, using longitudinal data um, would be better for looking at those in intra-subject differences. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have a question from Cindy. Hi, yeah, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was wondering how um, does the model know when to stop in terms of clustering more and more groups? Like, uh, for example, if we were to input data from healthy people, like uh, probably there will be variability there and, and is like, pro I, I'm guessing that you will find like group segmentations. So um, do you tune these settings when you are like, in, um, like preparing your data? Yeah, so the way that it decides on the number of clusters is basically it goes through and it fits um, models for increasing numbers of clusters. So it'll start with one and it'll do two, three, et cetera, um, up to some maximum number that you set. And then um, basically you can look at all of those clustering solutions um, and you can use um, information criteria to decide which one best models your data. So that allows you to balance basically uh, model complexity with model fit. Um, so, um, and we, yeah, and we tend to do that using cross-validation, which also means that the, um, that the subtypes provide um, added uh, predictive utility on um, left out data. Um, yeah, so that allows you to determine the number of clusters, basically. Uh, thank you. All right, I have maybe one last burning question. Um, so uh, in terms of numbers of biomarkers that we can include in those models, you mentioned that uh, like those models can handle quite a lot. Um, so I, I'm, I guess my question is, what is quite a lot? Like uh, up to which number of biomarkers can we yeah, typically so, include? Yeah, so it depends on how many scores you're looking at as, how, as well as how many biomarkers because that influences how, many, how granular your stages are basically and you want um, a kind of good enough number of subjects to be represented at each stage in order to estimate that accurately. Um, so if you're using something like in terms of kind of computational limitations uh, if you're using something like the event-based model where you just have normal, abnormal, you could, the maximum would probably be at about a hundred biomarkers or it would get really, really slow. Um, uh, but yeah, then if you're using um, a scored model, then also you have the kind of scores contributing to that. So the, the number that you would use would be less. Um, I think most people have used in the region of sort of 15 to 25 markers. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's far from doing voxel wise or something. <laughs> Maybe a future update. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that'd be nice. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, I think we'll close here for the uh, question period. So again, as a reminder, um, uh, if it's still okay with you, uh, I'd like to stay for a student discussion after for those who are interested. Uh, so if uh, you want to stick around for a student discussion, you're welcome to. And otherwise, uh, thanks again for the great talk. It was uh, really amazing. Great, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. <laughs>